Welcome back to GEMS with Genesis Amaris Kemp. With me today is Laura D. Benedetto. And here's a bit about Laura. She's a TEDx speaker, the number one best-selling author of The Six Habits and Life Mastery Coach. Laura teaches how to create the life of our dreams without sacrificing what we love. She's also the founder and CEO of Vision Advertising, a company that she built at age 19, and she has helped hundreds of entrepreneurs build and grow profitable enterprises entirely on their terms. And today, her and I are going to unpack how to be truly wealthy. So without further ado, welcome, Laura. Thank you. I'm excited to spend time with you again. <laughs> <laughs> so let's really unpack how are we how can we truly be wealthy? Because wealth to some people may be like, oh, I'm securing the bag. I have all the money. I have the big house, the nice car. When in actuality, they may be poor and broken inside because they have all the bells and whistles, but something internally is not right. So they're exhibiting that anger, that pain and frustration onto others because they're not feel really happy with themselves. They're happy at what their money could buy, but they truly don't love who they are. Absolutely. It's tragic. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt and keychain. So the thing with wealth is if you think about it, we talk about money, right? The stuff exactly as you said, but that stuff can't come with us when we die. We might be able to will it to those left behind, but at the end of the day, like, you, you know, your real human wealth is the time you have. That's it, right? And to, a, to a, another degree, you could argue that your health is also part of your wealth. Um, and a lot of the work that I do helps people to make the time you have be richer in quality, having your, your health return to you because you're not living a life as a big stress ball. So, you know, this isn't to say that having a lot of money isn't nice. It is. Um, it can give you a lot of really cool things and great experiences by, you know, putting you in a different, different economic bracket so you can afford to do these things that bring you um, some great highs for your life. But these are not the things that make you truly wealthy in the most important ways. <clears throat> There's actually a lot of, um, to the point you made a lot of financially wealthy people who are like dead inside and they're bastards. Right. Um, <laughs> I don't want to be that person. Nobody really is like, I can't wait to grow up and be a bastard. Nobody thinks that like, I mean, maybe they do when they're sociopathic, but the point is people like from the time that we're little kids, what do we want to do? We want to play. We want to have fun with our friends. We want to be happy. We want to laugh. We want to love and we want to enjoy our lives. And you know what? That desire doesn't change as we get older. Maybe our definition of how to achieve it does, but the definition doesn't change. Like we want that same freedom and joy and like whoa, being alive is amazing. Yeah, you just want that rush, the exhilarating without having all that unnecessary baggage because other people want you to be a certain way. Society wants you to act a certain way. And everybody that is in the world wants something, but just because they want something does not mean it's conducive to you personally or professionally. And we have to know how to set those healthy boundaries. We have to know how to do something for us that makes us happy, that makes us sleep good at night. And to your point, whenever you talked about, you know, some people may say your health is equivalent to your wealth. And I normally say, you know, if you don't have good health, then how are you going to enjoy your wealth? Because then you're going to be paying somebody to take care of you and do all these other things. But you've acquired, you know, all the riches or some people have that other story where it's like from rags to riches, from rags to riches. And then once you get the riches, if you don't know how to cultivate those riches that, that you have, then you could easily go back to rags. And people forget that. They forget that the same ladder you go up is the ladder you could come back down. They forget that you know the people who helped you get to your level of success are still there. So I feel like 
in my opinion, we need to get back to humanity. And that comes from who we are at its core, because if you don't know who you are, you're going to fall victim to what other people tell you you are, and they're going to box you in. And I tell people I wasn't born in a box. I'm not in a box. Don't place me in a box. I will be in a box if I choose whenever the good Lord above calls me home. But until then, I'm Genesis Amaris Kemp, and I'm authentically me. I don't have to put on makeup to do Instagram reels. I don't need to beat my face, quote unquote, to fit into what other people like. If you keep scrolling, that just means that you're not part of my tribe. And hey, I'm okay with that because I've done the corporate stuffy BS where I've tried to fit that mold for so long and it's freaking exhausting. Love when your personality shines, my friend. You are a sassy, sassy lady. Don't ever change. (laughs) The world needs more tough, tough chickies like you. It's good. I will be myself. Damn it. Good. So yeah, you know what? This is such a great subject. You know, when we think about like being ourselves, like I'm, I'm launching a podcast where I'm going to be talking all about sovereignty and stuff like that. And what you have just said is really all about one of the many flavors of sovereignty that gets me excited. Be your damn self. No, you don't need to put on the makeup. I mean, I have to like makeup, but you don't need to put it on. You don't need to please other people. You don't need to accumulate the car and the house. I mean, they're nice. And if you want them, you can have them. But the, the whole artificial list of the gotta do's, it's BS. It's all wanna do, right? And, and you can opt in or opt out if you want to. So <clears throat> we talked about um, a lot of different aspects of this, but man, like, big core driver for me is sovereignty. It's why I wrote my book, you know, and I'm not just talking about the political version of sovereignty. That's like talking, you know, that's, that's in the news these days. I'm, I mean, that one matters to me, but I'm, I'm really talking about the sovereignty that God gave us to be who we truly are. Um, we also were not born with makeup on our faces. So there's that or high heels or having to stuff ourselves into Spanx, nothing against the nice lady that invented Spanx, (laughs) but like, when we are fully expressed, when we are truly ourselves, when we are going about the world confidently pursuing our dreams and we're doing things in a less stress kind of way, you actually get to enjoy your life. You get to have fun doing the things you're doing. If you can find pathways to um, you know, do your work a little more efficiently, you get to have more of your time. You can make sacrifices today that will you know, pay you in the long term. Um, I mean, there's so many different nuances to this that we could really explore in a substantive way, but at the end of the day, if the major shift that, you know, seems like you're already there, but anyone listening to this, the major shift we want people to walk away with is wealth is not just money. Wealth is very much. And most importantly, it is your time and your health. And if you focus on those decisions will be different. You will perhaps prioritize your mental well-being. Perhaps you will not have conversations that you hate, perhaps you will actually enforce your boundaries because you realize how important your health and your wealth and your time is, you know, like you make different decisions when you prioritize those things. So, you know, obviously we can talk about my book. We can, you know, do a, um, you know, a little dive into that if you want to, but the, the major takeaway that I want everybody to walk away with is please prioritize the correct kind of wealth And then all the other decisions that you make, once you do that, will actually help you have all the different kinds of wealth. I totally, totally agree because whenever I think about wealth, I think about your emotional well-being, your spiritual well-being, and then, you know, your business well-being, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you are currently in the e-bucket, which is the employee bucket, but then you have your business on the side and you're just getting stuff accumulated so you could transition over fully into your own business. And then, you know, having that homeostasis balance with your family, because your family is a part of who you are. And when I say you're a family, I'm talking about your spouse and your children. Everyone else is extra because you didn't marry your cousins. You didn't marry your siblings or anything. I hope you married, not. <laughs> you married, <laughs> <laughs> you married your spouse, but I, I had to. <laughs> 
I feel like sometimes people like to interject in people's personal relationships because they feel entitled. And that's the problem. You have to have those healthy boundaries. And it goes both ways. Like, yes, I love my family. But when it comes to certain things, I'm not including you because I know we're traveling at different wavelengths. And that's okay. Because at the end of the day, you are not paying my bills. You're not sleeping in my bed at night. You're not putting gas in my car or you're not doing anything. You're my family by bloodline. But that does not mean that you necessarily treat me like family because I have some friends that treat me better than my own damn family. And it is what it is. Like no disrespect or uh, discord to them. It's just what it is. You know, we're on different ways. Well, sometimes family by choice is better than the family we were born with. True. And I guess what is it called? Family? <laughs> so I love I'm, family. I'm doing Friendsgiving. I'm super excited about that. I'm going to have all the, you know, friendly turkey. It's going to be great. My, my parents are still in Massachusetts. I'm in Florida. And it's like, well, I will take a photo of my dinner and send it to you. Therefore, we will be eating together. <laughs> you could Zoom them now because everyone's Zoom it. Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. <laughs> you know something? There's going to come a time in my life where I'm going to be like, I'm aching for some sovereignty away from Zoom. And if I never see Zoom again, it'll be too soon. <laughs> oh, you got to love Lori, y'all. She is just real. This is our second podcast doing t- uh, together now. And we've uncovered a lot of stuff behind the scenes. And you'll get to see us raw when we do an Instagram live. But, <laughs> you know, Laura, whatever we talked about boundaries, I picked up this book because it happens to be next to me. Boundaries. Okay. Have you ever read this book? No but it's got a fantastic title. (laughs) Boundaries by Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. It really tells you how to establish boundaries. And in the beginning, that was really hard for me, Laura, because I felt like instead of yes, man, I was that yes woman because I thought I had to please everyone based on my background because I'm Afro-Latina and Caribbean. My dad was South American and my mom is Caribbean. And it was just the culture that I was in. So it's like, you mm-hmm. do you do as you're told and then you respect your elders. And then I was like, man, this is exhausting because I feel like you give respect to get respect. And if you're not doing that, that you're dying a little bit inside. And if I'm dying a little bit inside, Side, how can I establish true wealth, right? Sure. Yeah. Hey, listen, one of my favorite subjects is boundaries. I also wrote about it in the goodness chapter of my book, Boundaries Matter. And I got to tell you, like, we feel so often like boundaries are rude. But why is that? I think, do you think, well, okay, so I don't think they're rude <laughs> in the slightest. Boundaries, when lovingly executed, are simply the rules of engagement, which are useful to know. I'd rather know the rules for someone and how they like to be treated versus just be a bull in a China shop by accident. True. And I guess the rhetorical question to ask the listeners and the viewers here is why is that important? Because I feel like sometimes people get mad when we set up boundaries for them, but when they set boundaries for us, they want us to follow it. And it's a two-way street, bro. It goes both ways. The same way you have boundaries is the same way that I have boundaries. And if you think about it this way, we're, and we're going to dive into your book next, Laura, if you think about calendar, mm-hmm. because I believe in planning everything on my calendar. And I tell people, if you're not on my calendar, don't try to break into my schedule because I'm not trying to break into your yours. At least respect what I'm doing, respect my time just as much as I respect yours. So I've had people tell me, oh, you're going to do this. No, you didn't wake me up to see another day. God did that. You didn't breathe into my lungs. So don't tell me what I'm going to do when I don't tell you what you're going to do. If I have time and I choose to do it, then that's on me. But if not, then that's okay. And, and I don't need to feel bad, but what you are doing is trying to project your guilt onto me because you want me to feel bad. So I and you can, get to decline. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I can, like that. That sounds like a you problem. <laughs> yes. But you like work that out with love. Go with God. Bye. Um, have it's fun. just like, Ooh, like they just don't understand that sometimes. You and know, then, my favorite line, what feel free to steal it. Wow. I love how open you are about your mental illness. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I've never actually used that. That's really rude. (laughs) I want to though. Sometimes I'm like, damn, homie, stay in the lane. But you just have to do that. And I think I really love the expression of boundaries is very, very important. And, you know, I think when people are new at it, they can be a little heavy handed. 
if they feel like very defensive, they can be very heavy handed, but like a very loving way to express boundaries. And I literally, you have to reinforce your boundaries like every day, especially with the people you love. And sometimes it's like, I really hear you. And I know that you're really upset about this right now. I can't have an excitable conversation, but I can totally have a calm one. Do you, do you need a few minutes? I'm happy to circle back in a few minutes. Um, you know, I've, I've used that, you know, sometimes like, even if like your child or whatever is just having like a moment or a meltdown, it's like, okay, you get to have your feelings totally legit. It's cool. I know you're upset. I don't blame you. Probably be upset too. Tell you what, this is stressing me out. I'm going to take a half an hour. You can go have an ice cream or whatever you got to do, calm down. And then you can tell me how you feel calmly. And I will listen calmly in like a half an hour. Is that okay? Yeah. The saw. So either take five, like the candy, or take 30 <laughs> minutes and you can watch a TV show and come back once everyone has reevaluated. Or calm. if you're really angry, take longer than a half an hour. It all depends. But like, you know, I mean, it could even be just like, you know, I, I really don't care for the way you're speaking to me right now. I don't think, you know, I, I find that like sometimes people be like really heavy handed with their execution of like stating their boundaries. You really don't have to be. I'm not an apologist by a long shot. Um, but I do recognize that boundaries are very uncomfortable for other people to receive or to be um, told about. So I try to soften the blow. So like if someone is speaking to me in a way that I find is really uncomfortable, you know, I, I'm not going to take their dignity and like run it over with my car. I'll just be like, you know, you probably don't realize it, but the way you're speaking to me is actually coming across disrespectfully and it's, it's kind of upsetting. So is there any chance we could change the tone? It's a nice way to express it instead of being like, hey, you're, you're really rude. I don't like the way you're speaking to me. You could do that. <clears throat> you could, I've done that too. It doesn't work as well. <laughs> you know, seriously, you get, you get further with honey than you do vinegar. So, but you know what nice. I think too, uh, Laura, I think it depends, um, who you're talking to because me coming from a male dominated field when I was in oil and gas, like if you say something to that man, but you're a strong woman, then you get labeled as aggressive or the quote unquote so? B word. And I'm like, I'm talking to you just like you were talking to me. So I don't understand what the problem is. But that's is. a them problem. That's a cultural problem. You can't fix that. It doesn't mean that you still don't conduct yourself the way you need to conduct yourself. And I'm sorry, but if the weak ass man that you're hanging around with cannot handle you being assertive, he doesn't deserve you, period. I am a tall glass of heavy caffeine coffee. I know that. And my husband, poor guy, he, uh, he has had to learn how to be strong enough to deal with me expressing my boundaries. And I've also had to learn to be more gentle, gentle in the way that I do it. And I actually, if you think I'm a bitch, that sucks for you because I'm actually a really nice person who isn't going to take your shit. That's it. And if you only like me when you get to abuse me, I am not winning in this relationship. So I'm going to see myself out <laughs> like ew. exit stage left. So yeah. Yes. So, so I guess I need to play this, this take to some of my girlfriends that are still in oil and gas, because the way that I did things, I think could be consequently why I got laid off in February or because, you know, I refused to go back to work when my father was sick, which he became my priority. And I'm not going to sacrifice my family's life in the height of a pandemic to go back to work whenever I can perfectly do all of my work at home, which I've been doing for X number of months, but we're going to hold your ground and you, you get to do that. And you know, the thing about employment is you are the one who is selling your time and your services in exchange for money. And the merchant has every right to decline to be told by the customer how it's going to be done. You get to decline. So boom, mic drop, peace out, homie. You're not doing it anymore. So it's all good. And like, if you got laid off, that's fine. Like, you know, I think a lot of people, um, including my former self, um, would look at that as a punishment and uh, a reason to discourage you from standing tall in the future and holding your ground again. Um, And when in fact, it's actually the opposite. It's just natural cause and effect. Um, If people don't like the terms that you've set forth, they get to decline the same way you get to decline. That's all it is. And when you take the emotion out of it, oh no, I lost something. Uh, Did you though? Because you would have lost a situation that didn't work for you. Did you lose? Did you? I don't think so. It sounds like, it sounds like you won, but it's a matter of a perspective change. You know, if you're 
going to approach all of this stuff from the, like, oh, I'm a victim and I can't stand up for myself. Cause if I do that, then, you know, I'll be penalized, which a lot of women are and feel that way. Um, you're never going to get ahead or it's like, no, there, there's cause and effect. And I know I can handle whatever the effect is, but I'm going to hold my ground with my spouse, my lover, my boss, my, this, my, that, like, I'm going to hold my ground because these are my boundaries and you get to do that. And like I said, we get to do it in a nice way. Sometimes with an employer, I myself am an employer. I've had um, employees hold their boundaries with me in a really bad way. And I've had some do it in a really like admirable, like, oh shoot, I'm going to take some notes kind of way because they did it so gracefully. And, you know, it's, it's a difference of, it's not so much the boundaries themselves, it's how we do it. And we don't need to be an apologist in order to hold our boundaries. And, you know, it depends, like you said, on who we're speaking to and the situation. Um, sometimes our voice is not heard when it's quiet. Um, you know, believe me, I, I can yell. I prefer not to. Everybody can. Um, but like, you shouldn't have to. And if you, you're in a situation where the only way you're heard and respected come someone you don't respect, perhaps that situation isn't that great after all. Yeah, you have to definitely weigh, weigh your options. And, you know, at first I was a little bitter. I'm going to be honest. I was more bitter that you laid yeah, me that off. happens one week after I found out one week after my dad died. So it felt like there was no sensitivity, mm -hmm. but then it was a blessing in disguise because had I not been laid off, would I have all this time to do podcasting and connect with people virtually and do virtual um, conferences worldwide and meet so many incredible people. So it's like a catch 2020 and you have to really look at things from a bigger, a bigger perspective. And that's what I'm mm -hmm. doing. Yes. I miss, you know, the good cushy paycheck and the perks and all of that. But you know what? In life, we have various seasons that we go through and each season has a particular reason. And there's a message that we're supposed to learn in that season. So what mm -hmm. message did you learn? How can you take what you learned and apply it and build upon it so you could grow mentally, physically, emotionally, as well as personally and professionally? And now that brings us to the six habits of your book. So what made you write your book, Laura? And what was the hardest thing to write in your book? And then what was the easiest? Okay, this is not a boundary, but this is a notation. My memory ain't that good. You might want to pepper me with these one at a time. <laughs> okay, I'll do it one at a time. Good, because relying on me to remember stuff doesn't tend to work out. Uh, all right, so I wrote the book because um, I was in so much pain and I was living a life that just didn't work. Um, it was, I, didn't, I wasn't living, you know, in accordance with my own boundaries. I was, you know, just doing things that didn't serve me. And I was chasing the wrong kind of wealth um, while sacrificing the only ones that really mattered. That's dumb. So I wanted to solve my own problem. And in solving it, I wanted to share it with other people. So that's why I wrote the book. What was the second question? Okay. So that's why you wrote the book. Thank you for explaining that. Okay, what was the easiest thing to write in the book? And then after that, I'll ask the next question. Okay, the easiest thing to write uh, was just like digging out stories from my past and like anecdotal evidence that like proved my points. Um, you know, it wasn't any particular chapter. In fact, um, some of the stories themselves were kind of painful but I lived through them. So I'm the subject matter expert. So it's not like I, I had something to research. It's like, no, I'm digging through the, the file cabinets in my head. Like I know what happened. I was there. So it was fairly easy to write about it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, writing about um, sometimes why they hurt or why the story in particular needed to be used. That actually, I think it called on a level of bravery that I wasn't anticipating that I would need in writing the book. Um, you know, because when you put yourself out there and you share very deeply personal or vulnerable stories, that hurts. But you know, the pain was necessary. And I did that on a solo episode because had you not experienced the pain, you wouldn't have, you know, the strength and the resilience to talk about it and to help other people who may be going through a, the pain similar to you. It may not Absolutely. be identical, but it may be in parallel. Now I want you to talk about the hardest thing. Think about when you wrote the book, what was the most painful story that you had to dig up 
in your brain to put into that book because you knew it was powerful, but you also knew what was attached to that painful moment. I was in a domestic abuse relationship. Um, and I say relationship in air quotes. Um, and writing about that was hard. And also um, that person is still very much alive, uh, has not passed on. And editorial um, censoring is necessary to protect the stupid. So I wanted to make sure that I was not slanderous. Um, I didn't love writing about it, but it's an instrument for good. So I could share it with other people. I also had to be very careful about what I chose to share. Um, it's, it's, it's actually very difficult to be specific while being vague enough to protect the stupid. Mm, and then just coming from a domestic um, abusive relationship, mm -hmm. it's, it's a beauty in, a, in itself, even though it hurts. And the reason why I say it's a, in a beauty, because some women never make it out of domestic abuse, but you did. No, and now- don't. And now you could talk about your story. You could talk about your resilience. And now you're married to your husband, which is amazing. So how did you navigate getting out of that situation, Laura? Um, I got out of the situation because I had finally basically had too much of the abuse. And I called my dad one day and I asked him to come get me. Wow. I really don't want to talk about more than that right now, if that's okay. Okay, that's fine. So we can It spells it out in the book. If you, re you really want to see my blood spilled on the page, it's in the book. I, I, I went through it once. That sucked. That was enough. Please read the book, by the way. It's really good. And I'd love a review on Amazon. <laughs> and there you have it. We're tabling that conversation for now, y'all. And she would like us to grab the book to learn more about um, her situation and how she got out. And then now that your book is out, what type of feedback have you been getting since a lot of people read your book and they gave you reviews? And what's the most exciting part to read? Um, well, the most exciting part to read is when people change their lives as a result of what they've written. I mean, actually the cool part is, um, so I send out a newsletter, not at any sort of regular interval because you know I'm lazy. Um, but I send it out and I always encourage my readers to reply and I do get replies. Those are like my favorite thing ever. Oh, I read the book. I love it. And, you know, sometimes I'll get questions and my favorite thing though is actually getting emails. I mean, the reviews are epic, believe me, they really help. But when I get a personal letter from someone who's like, yeah, you know, I read the book and like the second chapter, the third chapter or whatever really resonated with me. And since reading the book, I've noticed, and, you know, and doing the work and whatever, um, I've noticed that I treat myself better or I'm like, I'm more present with my children and I have you to thank. I'm like, yeah, your life is better because of me. Woohoo! Like, that's really cool. But like the feedback for the book has been, um, I would say it's been very, very positive. Um, it's got five stars on like the little, emoji, um, uh, icon or whatever on, um, uh, Amazon, but I think it's like 4.8, which is really amazing for me. Like it hasn't gotten five stars across the board. Like someone else, um, read the book and I think they didn't appreciate my writing style. That's fine. She's a writer herself. And she's like, Oh, she talks about herself. I'm like, well, I mean, I've been through some things. I mean, I am the subject matter expert on all these things. Why not? You know, it adds, ends, you know, adds some humanity and, you know, I, I think, but largely the, the feedback has been fairly consistent. It's that a, um, it's a pragmatic book written in a very realistic, approachable way where it's not very fluffy. It's not pretentious. It's not like filled with a lot of like abstract concepts. It's like filled with like actual instructions, do this thing in this order, blah, blah, blah. And you know, I think that just the average human, which I consider myself to be, um, will often appreciate a very straightforward, um, pragmatic approach to things. And, and that's been pretty much the overwhelming response is that A, it works. B, this is really like great foundational stuff. Um, it will make your life better if you actually do it. So, I mean, this kind of feedback, it's like gold. It's, it, I, like, I like knowing I've done a good thing. It is really nice, you know? 
And that's amazing that you're making an imprint. And while you're making an imprint, that's driving an impact. And you're actually seeing people in the world change because you were bold, you were brave, and you were courageous to own your truths and put it in a book. And as we wind down, Laura, I want you to leave us with one or two gems to solidify our segment today on how to be truly wealthy. Sure. All right. So here's a few gems for you. Um, one, uh, ask yourself, and by the way, this is a hard exercise, hard, grab a piece of paper and ask yourself, what are my priorities and write them down. Now revisit that list a week later. See if you missed anything, see if something on there is perhaps a bit shallow and it's actually not that important to you after all, what's really important to you. And sometimes it's a feeling, sometimes it's a person, sometimes it's a thing, um, or a situation, but what are your priorities? When you figure out your priorities, you've got your list, then order it. Seriously, figure it out. What is your number one priority? Your number two priority, blah, 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 blah. Some people will have God first. Some people will have marriage first, blah, blah, blah. It is your list. I am not judging you. I am not God. So I'm not going to tell you it needs to be God first. Maybe it is for you. Maybe God doesn't make the list. I don't know. This is your turn on this planet, not mine. Like you figure out your list and figure out your priorities. That's one little gem for you. Another one is to listen to your body. When your body is doing some funky stuff, like perhaps you've got diarrhea every day or you've got redness around your eyes. I know I just said diarrhea on a podcast. We're all adults here. We can handle it, but everybody goes poop. Okay. They even wrote a book about it. But like, if your body's doing some funky stuff intestinally, you've got redness around your eyes. Like I get when I'm like really, really like, um, you know, inflamed or your skin is doing some weird stuff, or you're just tired throughout the day. Like humans were not built to require coffee. Like if you are, you know, if you find that your body is not functioning, functioning optimally, look at it just because it's common for you does not make it normal. Right. And your body could be saying to you, yo, your stress level is through the roof, or you are actually incredibly, um, soul bankrupt. You know, you're not soul wealthy, you're soul bankrupt. So listen to your body. I mean, listen, your stress, stress and whatever, and feeling sad can make your skin change. It can make your hair fall out. It literally can give you diarrhea because it'll cause intestinal problems. Like these things can happen. Pay attention. And if you don't, you're going to suffer the consequences until you are forced to pay attention. Exactly. Mic drop on that one because stress is the number one killer, apparently. And Laura, go ahead and tell the listeners and viewers once again who you are, how they could connect with you on social media, and your CTA call to action. Well, the call to action is read the damn book. It's going to make your life better. <laughs> you know, if, if you really like a good pragmatic approach, if you love self help books, if you want something that's actually going to be the best book that you've ever had that will be a reference for the rest of your life that will make it exponentially better by challenging you and giving you a great insight into you read the book go the website is the www.the6habits.com the s-i-x habits.com it's also on amazon it's also on audible jeff bezos has enough money if you buy it direct from the independent author i make 50 extra cents Ooh. Woo. and all of laura's <laughs> contact information will be in the show notes. And just to summarize, I definitely want to encourage you to really be your authentic self. Stop living in the shadows of other people. You weren't made to be a carbon copy, but you were uniquely created and you are a masterpiece. And that's a part of you being truly wealthy whenever you know who you are and whose you are. So make sure you subscribe to this platform. You share it with a family member and a friend and check out Laura's book, The Six Habits. And until we chat next time, peace, love, and lots of blessings. Signing out, Genesis Amaris Kemp and Laura Di Benedetto.